thank God for you for the sense of progress that I feel. I feel so much right at home here. It seems like there's so many folks around here. There, just uh, here, sometimes on our uh, general home mission board, the fellowship with him. In such a short time, Brother and Sister Mahan was the evangelist out on the home mission uh, field and working with us on mission. And on the Cadol, Brother and Sister Pardon, our friends of long standing, preached revival for them and do for me. Tried to get him to take the church that I was pastoring one time, but uh, I made the mistake of having him come and uh, preach there before he consented to take the church. Because at that time, we were receiving about $2.50 a week, had been for some time. But we were living on it and uh, so on. Now, that was back in what they called the good old days, you know. Folks just want to go back to old time Pentecost. I just get the idea that some of them hadn't been back there. And I uh, don't know what it was. Well, friend, I've been back then. I've had the Holy Ghost 40 years. I've been preaching 37. And people that are really run down what Pentecost is now and glorify what it used to be. Uh, you just didn't live in the part of the country I lived in. Evidently, you did. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm carried away with it uh, right now. I'm, I'm happy, praise God. I'm really full on this thing. Praise the Lord. I've never seen a greater, better day than right now. Right now. Right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. No place for gloomy dresses and sad facts. Praise the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is great. Man, he's never been greater in my life. Man, it's great to be back here. And thank God, just right at home in the south, kind of warming up in here. And that makes it feel more like camp meeting, you know. And we'll get sweat in here real good, you know, and that helps to preach better. And uh, we're watching a little bit back here and so on. So, and we're having a great time. I always uh, used to enjoy when I was in St. Louis coming back down south and kind of relating with uh, what, you know, the kind of country I was raised up in. When I went back, well, I usually tried to take back some good food, you know, some good eating like uh, I used to, and like a miss sometimes in St. Louis. I'd bring back some sassafras and and we'd serve the folks around there some good fast fresh tea. And, and then I'd get some good ribbon cane syrup and we'd uh, enjoy that. And, and all kind of good soul food, you know. And we'd take that back. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> I remember one time having a, I got me a big uh, mess of turnip greens. And had it, I'm sitting on the seat beside me. And Jerry came along and. and Peeked into the sack and she said, Oh, she said, What kind of flowers are those? And uh, I said, That's not flowers, that's turn green. And, uh, <clears throat> and so that's some better than flowers. I tell you, you would uh, wop up some of that good food, you know, and, and invite some of the folks over and man, we'd have a time. Well, I'm glad tonight to be here. Thank God for Brother Sister Cox, our friends, long standing. And Jesus Christ is here tonight. Praise God. Oh, let's give him a hand tonight. Praise God. Oh, I appreciated that good singing tonight. I just really appreciate it. And uh, last night, these fine people from Gateway, Tim Gines here, the fellow that used to come over and eat up our grub in our house, and just grown so much. The young folks, they changed, you know. The fellow came up to me outside and said, you ought to remember me. He said, you remember when you preached the Kansas Count meeting? That's been about so old, about four years ago. I said, I know, but I said, you were, you were about this tall then. I said, you're about this tall now, and you changed so much. And, and the younger folks changed. And I said, me, I said, folks like us, we just get a little uglier, you know, and we don't change too much. But uh, <clears throat> we just thank God for everybody, and just great to meet you. And may the Lord richly bless you. It's been a great day. I have talked to Jesus today, and he told me once to preach. And I'm going to preach it to you by the help of the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to talk tonight about the signs of the time or what time is it? What time is it? This will not be a profound uh, <clears throat> analytical approach to prophecy, but uh, it's just maybe helping us to see the position of the church and the flow of God's intent for us in this day and time. And I think that's extremely important that we recognize where we are as the children of God, what's going on around us, and how we are fitting into it, the present situation. Matthew chapter 24, we will begin reading uh, with verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, Matthew 24, verse 21, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no place saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch as it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. The only is in the secret chambers, believe it not. The lightning are coming out of the east and shining even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. And uh, with that, I would like to invite your attention to Acts chapter 3, beginning with the 19th verse. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Until the times of the restitution of all things. Times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken to the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, includes Enoch uh, also, who had uh, great prophecy. Uh, <clears throat> then with that, First Corinthians chapter 10, there is a name of three situations here in the 10th chapter of uh, First uh, Corinthians and uh, verse uh, 32. There's three names here, and I read those three names. I read this verse for the sake of that particular grouping, because it is a biblical grouping. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, number one, nor to the Gentiles, number two, nor to the church of the living God. Thank this Lord, we approach this particular occasion not to entertain. Oh, God, forgive me, I pray tonight, of any thing that may be in my life that in any way will hinder the flow of your precious presence here tonight. I must feel thy anointing, O holy God. I must, Lord. I give myself to thee, Jesus, tonight. I pray, O Lord, that thy word would go forth, O Jesus, as a sharp striking arrow, that it would fall into the place, dear God, as thy spirit would direct it. In the name of the Lord, we ask it for your glory and for your honor. And we all say amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> According to the last verse of scripture that we read to you, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, there are three classes of people in this earth, majorly speaking, as God sees them. There is the Gentile, there is the church, and there is the Jew. These are the three major groupings that God looks upon in this world. We people that are sitting here tonight are not uh, Catholic people. We are not Protestant people. Sometimes people ask us that. Well, what is Pentecost like? Is, uh, you are a Protestant, aren't you? And, uh, and of course, uh, we must tell them, no, we are not Protestant. And neither are we Catholic. We are Pentecostal. We are apostolic. And uh, we're not protesting against the Catholic Church. We were before there was a Catholic. We are not a branch of anything. We're the stuff, praise God. And uh, from this, uh, there has flowed out some things that were not of us. If they had been of us, they would not have gone out from us. But they are there uh, today. The Jews uh, is God's sign. He's recognized in the world. 
And then, of course, we have failed to see that the church also has got time to I would like to say something about that tonight before we are through. And I would like to illustrate the movement of God's intent in the world as the hand of a clock as it moves around. And there are three time definitions upon many clocks. There is a short hand which uh, indicates uh, the hour. There is a larger hand which indicates part of the hour. And then there is another hand that moves faster, which indicates part of, um, of a minute. And uh, so these three particular hands, each making their movement around the clock, I would like to uh, represent tonight the Jews, the church, and uh, also the Gentiles. We will uh, tonight allow them to do so. There is only one time out uh, of 12 hours when these three hands on the face of the clock are absolutely synchronized, and this is at the hour of 12. At the other times, these three hands on the clock are in different places on the face thereof. But at the hour of 12, all three of them are on top of one another and perfectly synchronized. There will come a synchronization of the church, of the Jews, and of the Gentiles in time. A time when each of them in their own particular place reach the apex of where they are all headed tonight. The Gentile world, the Jewish world, and the church. All is moving towards a certain faithful hour. And we that sit here tonight are people of destiny. When the Jew, the Gentile, and the church synchronize, then, my friends, we will come to know that hour that Paul referred to in the first chapter of Ephesians when he said, In the fullness of time, God shall gather together in one, both which are in heaven above and which are in earth beneath, even in hell. It's no accident that when Jesus gave us the parable of the virgins that he said, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom coming. This was the point of perfect synchronization of three groups that God recognizes in the world. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Israel was to produce three, uh, three things. Out of Israel was to come the law. Out of Israel was to come the Bible. And out of Israel was to come the Christ. These three things the Jewish nation was supposed to produce. The Messiah, which uh, was to come from Israel, was to bruise the head of the serpent. And because that is true, Satan has not prevented at any time in trying to put down the, the promise of the Messiah and to destroy the Jewish nation. He has attempted to kill Jesus uh, ever since there was a uh, hope of doing that. That's the reason why that all the male children were killed in Egypt. That command went out. Pharaoh thought it was for one purpose, but uh, there was a hope of Satan that the lineage of Jesus Christ would be put down and destroyed. When Jesus was born, Herod gave the order that uh, all male children in the environs of Bethlehem should be killed. 884 years before Jesus Christ was born, there was only one male child that was living. That was the uh, star of the Davidic line, and through whose horns the Messiah would come. That one male child was protected by a woman with the name of Athaliah. For six years, that child lived in one single room and did not be outside of that room for, for six long years. Because in the loins of this child was the seed, the only seed remaining out of the Davidic line. And I'm here to tell you, friend, I am not one bit worried whether Jesus Christ is going to win this game or not. He is. He is winning it, and he will. Yes, he will. And there is no devil in hell out of hell that's going to be able to stop him. Haman tried to kill how he seemed of the Messiah. That was an edict that went out from Ahasuerus that all of the Jews should be killed. That meant the Messianic line should be put away and killed. Jesus Christ was crucified when he came to this world. And Hitler himself tried to kill how the Jews. And so persecution has been brought against them upon every side. Why? For two reasons. One of them is that the Messianic line should be destroyed. And another lie, reason is, so that God's time sheet and his clock and his time schedule uh, would be uh, upset. I see tonight in turn of this and in the flow 
row of history, six periods of time, which point us toward the centralization of the Jews, of the church, and of the Gentiles. And I want to mention these particular six time periods uh, after you tonight. It seems to me that all things have fallen into these particular time periods. The first period, and that is the year of 30 to 70 A.D. At that particular time, let's take a look first at the Gentile world. At that hand that is moving upon the face of the cloud. What was happening at that time, 30 to 70 A.D.? At this particular time, the whole world was synchronized. And for all up the, for the birth of Jesus Christ, the world was under one world government, and so many things were ready. Time war religion, people had gotten tired of them, and they had cast them aside. People's hearts were hungry for something that was fresh and real. The world was ready for the fall of the Jewish nation and for the rise of the church. What about uh, the Jews at this particular time? At this period of time, Jerusalem fell. They were dispersed. The natural olive branch was cut off in this particular time. A veil fell over the eyes of the Jews that remains largely until this day. And at that particular time, also, the church was born. It came into the world of a great revival. How the New Testament church, the uh, uh, New Testament uh, was written and the New Testament church was seated in and Christianity became a fact of world history and has been so since that time. So God synchronized the world. He synchronized the Jews. He synchronized the church for one matching thing, which was the birth of Jesus Christ, his death, his peril, his resurrection, his ascension, and the initiation of the church into the world. I am so glad tonight that I am living in the flow and the stream of God's intent. Not by chance, but great things are happening today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I have no patience for Pentecostal people uh, who groan around and moan around and uh, look down their nose and, and feel like that the world is just uh, kicked them in the shins and, and so I tell you, I am so happy about uh, what I have. And who I am and who I associate with, and I just, I just can't understand it. My son, we went out to eat, and we went over to First Cafeteria, and we had uh, two other couples beside ourselves. We got over to First Cafeteria and ran into a bunch of uh, Pentecostals over there that was uh, already there. Pentecostal folks, uh, how they <coughs> do, you know, and uh, so uh, we ran into some folks there. Well, we praised the Lord, shook hands, and talked about the service, and Talked about the four that got baptized that morning and all the great things and, and we waved at one another, you know, and, and you know, I just noticed all over that cafeteria, people turning and looking at us. Did you know how that made me feel? Every one of those Pentecostals looked to me like was the finest looking folks in the whole cafeteria. They were outstanding looking. They were not but drag or drug out down cast. They were well kept. They were neat. They were nice. They look, the women look like ladies, and the men look like gentlemen. Praise God. I was happy about it. Hallelujah. And so we passed through here, here at number one, and that was the synchronization of the world, the Gentile, the Jew, which gave us our Christ in our church. And that was the last time those hands have been synchronized. And uh, so it has moved on through the symbolic 12-hour period from that unto this. And, uh, of course, right after that, there came, now, 300 years later, a complete, uh, uh, not altogether a complete falling away. But there was a decretion and a decline. I was at a camp meeting not long ago, and I preached about what God was going to do and what he was doing in the world today. And after it was over, a fellow came to me with his Bible, and he said, I have a few words, uh, I'd like to, a few questions I'd like to ask you, and, uh, about what you preach today about the Bible. And I said, all right. He said, uh, have uh, you ever read uh, what Paul had to say to the special agent? And uh, I said, yes, I have. And I said, uh, I'd like to ask you a question before we turn to it and read it. And I said, uh, who was he writing that to? And he said, to the special agent. He said, of course, it applies to us today. I said, yes, it does. 
I said, uh, was there or has there been a falling away since Paul wrote that to the Thessalonians? And he said, well, of course, there has. He said, they went into the dark ages. I said, that's right. I said, now, then they have already had a falling away. How many more fallings away are we supposed to have? And so on. Well, I tell you what, there was a time in my life that I preached fallings away. And I kept on preaching until I got it. And friend, I really got me a good one. And after that, oh, I was satisfied. And I didn't want any more falling away. And so I started preaching revival. And I've had revival. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you want healing, preach healing. If you want the Holy Ghost, preach the Holy Ghost. If you want a falling away, preach it. You'll get it. Praise God. You want revival, praise God. The God of revival still lives. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I'm thankful for God's graciousness and his goodness. Year number two, the year between 30. 70 AD, we have looked at the years between 1900 and 1915. The good time world. They were girding for battle at that time, getting ready for World War I. The machine age had come in and swept over the world. Cars were on the road. And steam engines were upon the rails. This was an age of progress and so on. The wireless had been brought into existence and people were able to communicate uh, better. Religion had begun to fade away and uh, there was skepticism on every side and the world was ready for revival. What about the Jews at that time? This was the time of the Jewish protocol. Maybe some of you folks here tonight have never heard of the Jewish protocol. I can remember when I was very, very young boy, I heard of the Jewish protocol. My dad talked about the Jewish protocol. And then for years and years, I never heard anything else about the Jewish protocol. I do know at that time that Henry Ford had that thing published and published and published and passed it all over the country. It wasn't until about 12 years ago that I got my hands for the first time on a copy of the Jewish protocol for a long time. At that particular time, there was great persecution. 30,000 Jews moved out of Russia in the ghettos of Poland and uh, of Russia. They died by a thousand. And that 30,000 made a long trek by foot to get to uh, Palestine. They fought uh, uh, for their lives against the Russian prophets and uh, the Polish children. And uh, it was a marvel that any of them ever survived to get down to the land of, Pal of uh, Palestine. Among that 30,000 that left Russia, there was a young man by the name of Ben Durham that went along with them, who was destined to be the first premier of the new state that was going to be born in 1948. In 1915, England wanted Memphis power. She was getting ready for World War II. I would like for you to understand tonight how the God uh, makes things to synchronize to bring about his purpose in the world. I hear the day of it, no kingdom and no power can come against God but to watch his purpose in this world. Not God. Never has and never will. And so all England needed most of power. And so there was a brilliant young scientist with the name of uh, a Shane Wiseman, who was a Jew, who happened to come by England at that time. They knew something about this uh, Jew's uh, ability, and they asked him, to invent and bring to them smokeless power. This fellow set to work on it, and in 30 days, Shane Wiseman gave England smokeless power. And so England asked them, him, said, what would you like for me to do for you? This young Jewish man turned to them and said, I want you to give my people their country. I want a home for my people. And it was then that England gave it to them at that time. They could see, friend, how the world and the Jews began to move together for that particular time. What about the church now? In that uh, period, number two, at that time, friend, there came slavery upon the earth in Topeka, Kansas, where people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the year of 1900. Back in India, there was a woman by the name of Mother McCarthy that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in India. And the power of God began to fall. It came with tongues of fire upon the receivers in India. And so it was the world began to move together. The Gentile world, the Jewish world, and the church, a step by step, moved up another period. 
Here I am not preaching tonight to ordinary people off the street. I am preaching tonight to the church, which is the body of Christ, fall of his bones and flesh of his flesh. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. The Pentecostal experience took me right down to the ground. I went to church as far back as I can remember. My dad was a Baptist minister. Far back as I can remember, I went to church. I remember for a pastor meeting, the Rush Arbor meeting in the Baptist church. Heard my dad preach a lot of times and so on. Talking to someone not long ago, and they told me, said, I'm Baptist and so on. And they began to have tried to inform me something. I said, I know more about that than you do. I said, I've heard that from a way back. I can tell you about the eternal son yet. I can tell you about accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I can do all of that. I've heard that. I sit on those benches and so on. And I thank God for what my dad preached to me. And I thank God for the good life that he lived. And I thank God for the good home that he lived. Had. Friend, when I put my head for the first time into Pentecostal church, there was something about it that got hold of me. Praise the Lord. And I have been the same sin. Not trying to be. Glory, glory, glory. I thought you folks were going to shout really big for a while here tonight. And I kind of hope you would. Maybe, maybe tomorrow night. Hallelujah. I, I like shouting. I, I like a lot of loud hand clapping. I like loud singing. Hallelujah. I like to see people put their hands in the air. Praise God. Woo! When I first got the Holy Ghost, I thought the Lord came down on you and blessed you in such a way that when you shouted and you couldn't help it, you know. He just overpowered you. And I found out later that you could shout without just being absolutely overpowered. It was just the way it worked out. And I used to shut my eyes and just to flail away at it, you know. And I've got uh, scars on my shin bones to this day, blazing through all the benches and chairs and things like that. And I learned that I could shout with my eyes open and enjoy it just as well. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Here is number three, the year of 15, 1915 to the year of 1917. The Gentile world was lost in battle. The map of the entire European cup was rearranged, proportioned so that it would better fit into the ten toed kingdom, which we shall see in our day and time. So God started to take everything step by step. What happened to the Jews in the, the, the third period that we're referring to right now? Now, uh, General Allenby, in 1970, captured Palestine from the church, and according to the promise that they had made to James Wiseman, they gave it to the Jews, just like they promised James Wiseman that they would do it, and gave the Jews a right to return, because the Jew had given England smokeless gunpowder, which they needed so much. What about the church? Well, in the year of 1915, already the Holy Ghost had been falling for 15 years. But in the year of 1915, there came a glory of revelation. It was in that year that Brother O.L. Foss and Brother F.L. Wise were baptized in Jesus' name in Elder Louisiana. And so revelation began to come. The Gentile world, the Jews, the church moving up step by step. I am not preaching tonight to just ordinary people. I am preaching tonight to people from whom they are doing well. Glory. Glory. Angels are interested in you tonight. They can't figure out your redemption. They can't understand the forgiveness of sin and so on. They don't understand a lot of it. But uh, thank God uh, we're enjoying it tonight. Here is number four, the year of 1939 through the year of 1945. What was happening then? The Gentile world was girding itself for battle for that awful, bloody World War II uh, debacle. And uh, people were getting ready to fight. What was happening to the Jews? The Jews had gone to Palestine. They had drained the swamp. The Arabs became jealous and began to put pressure upon them. And England needed oil. So it withdrew its, uh, its agreement with the Jews. It restricted migration to 5,000 Jews uh, per year. And it called the white paper, the white paper that was written, it recalled. And uh, so that was done away with. And there was no hope uh, for a larger Palestine. So a death trap was evolved for the Jews. And millions of them died in Nazi Germany. And so the Jews saw that there was no hope anywhere in the world except finally in Palestine. God was 
getting them ready. He was putting the pressure upon them. During the days of the flood, when animals needed to get into the ark, God had a way of getting those animals in there. And those animals had to be moved in. It had to be at a certain time. And it had to be a quick work. And only God could do it. And so God arranges the world. He arranges turns in. He synchronizes it all so that his eternal purpose is wrought at his particular time. He throws a pitch of water to destroy to whatever it does. Here's the fly. Because God's intent will be brought about by whatever steering uh, that for a period of time. It was a tough situation for the church, too. The spirit of time was a tough situation for the Jews. It was also a tough situation for the church. There is a strong parallel between the church and the Jews. They are similar in a lot of ways. They believe in one God, and they are different, and they are separated, and they are distinct among the nations. And so on. We could go a long way. And so as it was rough on the Jews during that particular time, so also it was rough on the church. I'm sure some sitting here tonight can remember the war years when there was a lot of people that was in good, strong, sound, stable Pentecostal churches who came to their pastor, couple after couple, and said, Brother so-and-so, I hear that there's a tremendous uh, place to be made in such and such places in the shipyard, in the defense plant, and so on. We got a cousin that's living in such and such a place. He helps me that uh, we can make so much an hour, and so on. True, they'll freeze you on the job. But man, if I could get close to a job like that, I wouldn't care. And so they went away, and they didn't only go away. Sometimes when the whole congregation was depleted, the preacher went himself, and he got him a job about building army camps and making ships, and so on. People made money, and a lot of Americans went to hell. During that particular time, it was a hard time for the church. Very few people relatively received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and uh, so it moved on. There were few revivals during that particular time. I can remember the day that I went up for my pre induction examination on August 1944, and uh, the date for that pre induction examination was the 16th of August. And uh, I remember the long lines of boys that, as we filed through there and were examined for the army. I can remember preaching revivals during that time. I did not pass my, my induction examination. And I can remember going out and preaching revivals. There were few revivals. There were few people relative that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People were worried about the war. They were worried about making money. Worried about time. Worried about arms to iron weight. And so on. It was hard to get a hold of. Year number five, the years between 1946 and 1967. In 1948, a war was fought in Palestine. We're going to talk here about the Jews. What happened to the Jews in the fifth period? There was a war in Palestine. The Jews had been moving in, moving in, moving in. And the Arabs got uneasy and said, that's enough. We're going to massacre them. And there at that time were 100,000 Arab soldiers that were ready to fight these Jews. There were millions, 40 million Arabs that were pitted against this 1 million uh, Jews that was in Palestine at that time. The Jews had nothing to fight with the broomstick and just a few other things. They fought in the valley of Kewa, the same valley that David came against Goliath with. And when the Arabs and the Jews were in battle there, Arabs thought things and tried things that were weird and unearthly. I'm here to say you tonight, my friend, that what God has purposed to do, he will do. Yes, he will. Glory, 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 glory. If I'm talking tonight to somebody here that's worried, upset, and you think, oh, dear God, I'm going to the park, and so on, here to tell you that uh, when we're in the will of God, and uh, when we're in the church of the living God, everything's going to be all right. It's going to work out. I don't know how, but he will. It's got to. And he will. Yes, it will. Praise God. Hallelujah. What about uh, what happened then? Then came the day of June the 6th, 1967. In three hours, there was 300 of Egypt's 350 planes destroyed and destroyed on the ground. Moshe Diane reached the canal on Wednesday. And there were 35,000 Arabs that died in the desert. 
What a massacre took place. What happened in the Gentile world during this time? Knowledge increased. The computer was introduced, and knowledge doubled itself in short order. The space age was ushered in. Men went into space. Unheard of things happened. Travel increased. Americans roamed the entire Earth's surface and the whole world. People were uprooted. Corporations shifted people like dominoes upon a table. And people who had never got out of their homes went out of their homes and began to live in various parts of the country. It became easier to preach the gospel. And revivals uh, began to change. Systems changed and collapsed. Things that people had helped and been believed in for so long began to be shaken. We're living in a time you will find a strike in the last chapter of Hebrews. And this is parallel with the New Testament churches. And this is what Paul wrote uh, to the New Testament Christians, especially to the Jews. He said, that which can be shaken shall be shaken, so that that which cannot be shaken may remain. We're living in a shaking time. And things, morals are being shaken. Truths are being shaken. Our traditions are being shaken. And so on. People are being shuffled around, being shifted away from things that they used to hold to. And you know what happens when this occurs? Revivals begin to come. How people that uh, used to hold to picture doctrines and theology, how uh, they begin to uh, look around for something else. In the community that you're living in now, there was something that crumbled in those years between the year of 1946 and 1967. Something broke down in that community. Yes, it did. Hallelujah. What about what happened to the church? 1962, a fellow in your neighboring state had the audacity to say, God's dead. There were bumper stickers all over the nation cropped up and said, God was dead. And uh, black masses began to be held. I could hardly believe my ears that day between Houston and Fort Arthur. I had my radio on, and I didn't know what I was listening to. I come to find out on what Rice University campus in the chapel, I was listening to a black mass. In that chapel, they described what was going on. There was a, a casket. In that casket was an actual card. Where they got it, I don't know. And there was the, the altar was draped in black. There was caps that was chained to the altar and caps that was chained uh, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, casket. And there was cat blood that was offered as a sacrifice as they went ahead with the black mass. And uh, there was such an end at that time, some of the spiritists that uh, we still have with us. And uh, Satan moved in. Satan worshiped began to be uh, uh, evident at that particular time. So a revival was on the way. The devil was trying to stop it. Bishop Pike rose up, and he had put his little two bits in. His son became a doper, and the bishop died in the desert of the Middle East. And uh, so I'm here to tell you, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and darkness and rulers of darkness in high places. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. God's program will go forward. Yes, it will go forward. And nothing, nothing in this world can stop it. Hallelujah. So, in 1962, American businessmen began to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we didn't believe they were receiving it. I remember <clears throat> my lawyer in Beaumont, Texas, and I used to go see him for a few things that I had need of. I could hardly believe my eyes. I didn't believe it. And they told me, said, uh, uh, Jack King has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I just frankly said, I don't believe it. And uh, so on. I went back to see, I was a business, uh, a little while after that, about two months later. I came into his room. He was sitting behind his desk. He got up from his desk. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Brother Hugh, he said. He came around that desk. He swept me up in his arms. He hugged me. He began to speak in time. I could hardly believe my ears. It's a strange thing. And why was that hard for me to believe? Because when I was 14 years old, after I'd had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, one year, a new church was opened in Zawale, Louisiana. Brother Sam B. Stockner opened that church. There was only one family in Zawale that had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and that was my oldest sister. So, when Sue was out, she said to me, he says, buddy, to come over and help us open the church. Well, I wasn't the 14, but I loved God, and I could pray, and so I went over there. Brother Stockner had the uh, floor up on the church. He had the studs up, had a roof on it. His money ran out. And uh, so that uh, was as far as he had gotten. And uh, so uh, we were having revival there.
had the revival out on the floor, and there some, had some benches there, no side. Folks would come boiling around there, and they would throw tin cans and rocks in there on the floor, and so on. We had prayer meetings down there in the morning time, and so I remember one particular morning, went down for prayer, and my sister had what they call an old hoopie, and I, which was a, on their car, the pressure wore out, you know, and they took the top off and put a bed on the back, and, and so she went on home in the hoopie, and uh, so I, I walked. And that was one morning I wish I had gone with her, because between that place and home, there was three fellows, 18 or in the early 20s, and began to call out to me, Hey, holy roller! Glory, 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 glory! Holy roller! Holy roller! Glory, 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 glory! That's their hand. They began to walk fast, and I started walking fast. And as well, they began to run, I started running. And uh, so I thought, if I can cut across the schoolyard, I can run through the mill, and uh, I will get home quicker. And But uh, they were gaining on me. As a home economic uh, cottage there on that little old school campus in Jawali. Sometimes that was left open, and uh, I ran to that door. If I could just get inside and lock that door. I remember the fear that gripped me when I grabbed the hold of that screen door and yanked on it, and even the screen door itself was locked. Those boys were on me. They tore my shirt off of me. They stripped me out of my pants. They took me and they shoved me against that wall. They picked me up and used me as a battering ram against that brick wall. Every time my shoulders and my head hit that brick wall, I literally saw stars. I heard my neck crack every time my head hit that wall. I uh, was more unconscious than conscious. Finally, when they dropped me like a wet rag upon that cold concrete floor, and I dimly heard that uh, Harrison fence gate slam as they walked out of that yard. If somebody had told me then that they are going to come when the boys, the church, where those boys attend church, the people in that denomination are going to get the Holy Ghost and they're going to speak in tongues, I would have said, you're crazy, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. The first Pentecostal church that was built, building was built in Nova Louisiana, my half brother wrote it to help burn it down. And uh, I can remember the time when my half brother, he uh, stood it out front door and gave with a rope in his hand. And uh, my mother was uh, on her deathbed. He, uh, he spoke to me and says, Buddy, he said, if you folks have stopped in a tray and start that hooping and hollering in there, we're coming in there and drag him out, and we're going to hang him in that old tree down there at the corner. And I suppose he meant what he had to say. If somebody had told me that God would move upon people like that, I said, you're crazy. But I'm here to tell you that God can do and will do more than we can believe him to do. There is nothing that can stop him. There are some things that uh, depend upon the prayers of the church. Local revivals and some other things. There are other sovereign moves of God that God doesn't ask anybody about. It just fits into his time program and he has it. God never asked anybody whether he could have a flood or not. He had it. God never asked anybody if he could burn down Sodom. He burned it. God never asked anybody when Jesus Christ ought to be born. He was born at the fullness of time. God never asked anybody when to pour out the Holy Ghost. He poured it out. Praise God. There are some sovereign rules of God that come when God wants them to come. Why am I speaking a sermon like this tonight? Because you are looking at a preacher from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I want to be right in the middle of God's plan. I want to hear what he's saying to the church. I want to be right in the step of him. I want to know what the Spirit is saying to the church. Okay, preacher, you got it all figured out? So, sir, I used to have it figured out better than what I've got it figured out now. If you had asked me something about all of this stuff, <laughs> I've been preaching about five years, I could have really, really told you. But now then there are some times in days like this that uh, you begin to wonder. But I do know this, my dear friend. My ear is wide open to what the Spirit is saying. Uh, my eyes are wide open. Praise God. If there is anybody here tonight that can teach me something I don't know, I'll be your student. Praise God. Yes, I will. I'm hungry for truth. Praise the Lord. I'm wide open, praise God, to what God's got for me. Woo! Glory, glory. The year 1967, the year 1960 through 1970, the sixth period, the Jews were attacked on the Day of Atonement. Unwritten law that, uh, that there was no attack to be made on the holy day. 
and they were not ready for it. There was a protest lodged in the UN because they were attacking on the day of atonement. Jesus had died on the day that the Paschal Lamb was supposed to have been slain. And according to the Jewish calendar, the Jewish nation themselves were portrayed upon the day of atonement. God uses certain times and certain events to work out his own design, his own purpose in the world. If you have read uh, much about Jewish history, you read here a few years ago, our Messiah. We will be crowning our Messiah. The Jews today are badly in need of an agreement. The United States is shifting its influence away from them because the United States knows that she needs oil. She must not turn her back upon the energy nations of the Middle East. The Antichrist is going to be, as it were, an answer prayer to the Jews when he surfaces himself. They will make an agreement with him. They will be deceived. And the agreement that they make will be broken. And a remnant of the Jews will be saved. And uh, they will uh, they will have their time in their place in the world's art from time to come. In 1948, Israel became a nation. I read it on the front page of Shreveport Times. I shall never forget uh, how it affected me. I had heard people preach that when I was just very small and swung my feet off of the benches and was not able to touch the floor. I would heard that it would happen. I heard Brother C.G. Weeks preach that. And by the year of 1988, friends, some things that are astounding will transpire. And I will say this tonight because that in the year of 1948, Israel had become a nation. A generation is a, a 40 year situation. And by the year, add 40 years to 1948, and you come to the year of 1988, in the next 10 years, you can expect some tremendous changes. I believe that. I believe that. I will make a prediction tonight, and I think that I can be substantiated and verified in it, that even in the next two years, you folks that are sitting here are going to witness a major military confrontation somewhere in this world that is going to have world-reaching effect within the next two years. We are moving up quickly. The hands are about to come into place one above the other. The last time it happened was at the inner end of the New Testament church, right after the ascension of Jesus Christ. And the budded, uh, uh, Israel budded prophetically in Christ's day. And he said of those people, this generation shall not pass until all of these things shall be fulfilled. And they didn't. It was fulfilled in their generation the thing that pertained to their generation. I believe that I am preaching tonight to a generation that's going to see many wonderful and astounding things occur. What about the Gentiles? Now the move, uh, the minute hand is moving up, moving up faster. The Jews are in a position, and uh, the minute hand is uh, is moving up. God has already appeared the Gentiles to take out a veil of people for his name, and not all of the uh, uh, people that uh, are being filled with the Holy Ghost today are filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, some of them are, many of them are not. Maybe most of them that say they are, are not. But there is going to come out of that something. And uh, God is going to have a church. Yes, he is. Europe needs a unified religious faith today. It doesn't have it. I've been having quite a bit of association with the European continent over the past few years. I have never in my life spoken to people more agnostic, more skeptical, uh, more uh, godly than the people of Europe. They do not have the Bible background that you and I have. Their religion has to do with something cold and staid and ritualistic. They don't know much about the Bible. Most of the people doubt that there's even a God. They are wrapped up in materialism. We wonder about them and pour, have poured our tax dollars into Europe. Europe is in better financial condition tonight than we are. When you look around, you can't look anywhere but what you see a building crane. There is much industry. Things are going on there. That country is booming. I remember riding in the taxi cab out to the Holiday Inn and, uh, uh, in Luxembourg, and the taxi driver spoke uh, English well. 
He just says in an instant, he said, uh, there is uh, the, the uh, capital of uh, the United States uh, of Europe. And I said, well, I wasn't aware that uh, that had materialized yet. No, he said it has. Really, no, that's right, it has. But it's going to. And this is the capital that's being built now. I was back there again last year and stayed in the same holiday inn. Much of this uh, work had been done. Much had been, been done since it was there last time. Acres and acres of ultra-modern buildings. I walked across the, uh, the freeway that separated. And I walked over there and I walked among those buildings. It was the rain, but I walked in the rain, and I stopped, and I looked up at those buildings, and I thought, well, here is going to be the seat of the, the government of the United States of Europe, and even now, it is being built. And uh, there is something that is quite promoting about it. If you have not read the book, please read it, The Day That the Dollar Died. Our money, friend, is uh, not going to always be substantial. The floating situation that we have now, it's uh, in time going to come to an end. Uh, there's going to come a time when people's uh, finances are going to be known worldwide. Where that your name and number is going to be able to be bounced off a telestar somewhere and uh, your financial condition can be read right out. Only in this day have we been able to compute every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever lived. As to financial condition, age, and what not, and where you live. This is a really a different day that we are living in. I was in, uh, in Alaska during the last war in the Middle East. I called the pastor to come pick me up. He said, I'll be just a little late. He was. He came by. He had three soldiers with him. He said, I must uh, deliver these boys uh, up on the mountain. And uh, on the way up, as we raced through the streets of uh, Anchorage, he told me, he said, there has been a general military alert. Why it is, I don't know. But uh, said all of the available men are being rushed out to the outer perimeters of our defense around here. And uh, these are the fellows that I am supposed to carry. We went up the mountain, up until we saw flashing lights. And there were three MPs that blocked their way. And checked us out. And we had to turn around from that point. The boys that we brought were loaded on a bus along with others and rushed up to a missile site that was just on the other side of the mountain. I didn't know what was going on. Later on, it wasn't until almost a year later that I read what had happened. Russian ships moving through the, uh, the straits on their way to Egypt. And uh, the Jews, and Egypt, the Arabs were locked in battle. And those monitors on the side of those straits who were coming out of Russia on the banks of Turkey had picked up the fact that those ships had hydrogen missiles in them and that they were headed for Egypt and were going to arm the missiles of the Egyptian army with hydrogen weapons. When this happened, Marines immediately came to alert. Ships began to move towards the Middle East. Aircraft carriers began their circle in the Mediterranean. And men in Alaska came on the alert. And the boys that stepped out of the pastor's car that night on the mountainside, Brother Blackshear said, I don't know when we'll see you. We may see you next service night, and uh, we, we may not see you. Said, we'll just well pray for it. And that was it. And so tonight, friends, the hands move forward. Here to tell you, friend, that in those days, down in the cave of Palestine, the Jews working night and day put together the first hydrogen missiles and became able to knock the Arabs off the face of the earth. They put it together and were ready to use it. I'm going to tell you something. When they start to push those people into the sea, they will not be pushed into the sea. There was a time when they used to have a, a, a culture, a Masada culture, where the Jews up in that great stronghold killed one another and crucified themselves. But now then they don't have any more a Masada concept. The Jews now have a Samson concept, which is we're going to reach out and we're going to pull the whole house down. We may go down, but we will not go down alone. We will not kill one another like we did in Masada. But we'll be like that. We'll take a lot of bullets when we go. 
And you can look for that, friend. I preach the life that you will hear the of the earth to what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Yes, sir. Praise God. Praise God. And so we come to the year of uh, 1970. My father, the king of the north, is getting her ships ready. Russia outstripping us in a lot of ways. The Middle East getting ready. God has already built the road through the Himalayas. He's ready to move 200 million men in an army in the direction that needs to go. And so, what about the church in this day and time? Uh, it used to be so hard to see people get uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, it did. I'm talking to the Spirit. I began to seek the Lord in January. Don't tell me I didn't seek Him with all my heart. I sought Him with all of my heart. I was plowing an old hard mouth in you, man. And uh, I, uh, that was the meanest mule that uh, I ever met. And uh, uh, I would get very angry. And I believe if I could have, and I had it done, there were times I would have uh, killed the mule. But uh, I was just a kid. And I couldn't whip the mule like a mule was supposed to be whipped. And uh, I sometimes I just throw everything down and get run around there and get that mule with a fist and bang my fist into that mule's face and get up my knuckles and I'd get up there sometime and get that ear and pull it down there and chew the head off of it. And uh, it was terrible. And during that time, I was trying to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And, and so I would pray every morning, dear God, help me not get mad at Kate today. And then I would pray for Kate and I'd say, God, help Kate today and help Kate to do right. And I thought God, I thought God was all of my heart. I did. I thought him was all of my heart. I did not receive the Holy Ghost until May the 7th of that year. I never want anybody to go through what I went through. It was, it was terrible. Well, it makes you live for God better. No, it didn't. I've still got scars on me and my fears and my doubts and all that I drugged myself through during those times. It's not supposed to be that way. Don't tell me it is. It's not. It didn't do me any good. If somebody had just sat down and told me, praise God. But it was rough, man. And the persecution, friend, we had it. Yes, sir. I know. And uh, so, what about today? Well, <clears throat> I was talking to a fellow from Brazil about three or four years ago. Telling me about uh, being in a service one night, and suddenly during that service, something begins to blow and begin to roar in that service like a tornado. People started reacting to the noise that uh, was imposed upon that meeting. And when the, and they were through, 1,812 had been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I remember one day. In the third camp, I never heard anybody approaching receiving Holy Ghost. Uh, no explanation of how to get the Holy Ghost. And there was nobody getting the Holy Ghost. And I was preaching my heart out. Now, uh, the Lord just was speaking God. I just felt like doing something. I went to Brother Brandy. I said, to Brother Brandy, I'd like to meet with all of those who do not have the Holy Ghost, just me and them. And uh, I want to talk with them. And he said, well, we don't uh, have any place. I said, I'll meet with him under that tree there down by the river. And he said, all right. So we met with him, and we talked with him. I just talked to him out of my heart, and God might have known anything. I talked with him in tears. And after I'd finished talking with him and assuring them that the Holy Ghost was a gift, and God wanted to give him the Holy Ghost, there was a young girl that came to me. She looked like she'd had the Holy Ghost all of her life. She was about 19 years old. She said, Brother Pugh said, ever since I was nine years old, I've sought for the Holy Ghost. I've sought for the Holy Ghost ten years. I've laid flat on my back and sought for it. I've knelt and sought for it. I've prayed and sought for it. I've fasted and I've sought for it. But I've been seeking it for ten years, and I have not received the Holy Ghost. And she was weeping, and her, her chin was quivering. And I said, that's the Holy Ghost that you feel right now. I said, it's right here under this tree. You could receive the Holy Ghost right now. And she looked at me. The Lord opened her understanding. She looked at me shocked and surprised. 
And she said, Brother Pew, do you really mean that that is the Holy Ghost I feel? I said, it certainly is. She said, you really mean that I could receive the Holy Ghost right now? I said, you can. And when I put my hands on you, you will receive the Holy Ghost. <sighs> I just couldn't care. Well, I didn't, I didn't have time to think about what I said. Later on, I reflected on it. It wasn't me. <laughs> because I never heard anybody say that. And uh, so we worshiped. And then I reached over and touched her on the head. She began to speak the tongue. The Holy Ghost fell. It fell. It fell all day long. Those kids received the Holy Ghost in the dormitory. People received the Holy Ghost in the kitchen. They got the Holy Ghost underneath the table. They got the Holy Ghost in the classes. 128 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Hallelujah! And that wasn't something I read in a magazine. It wasn't something that I heard about. I was there! Here to tell you this is God's church. And these are great and wonderful days that we are living in. And your God is as big as you'll let him be. Yes, he is! Praise God. In the year of 1940, just before Brother W.T. Witherspoon died, he prophesied, even on his deathbed, he said, you are going to witness the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost that the world has ever seen. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's a Mississippi Methodist preacher preaching on television before an audience of how many I don't know. While people were looking at him and he was preaching an ordinary message, the pastor of the First Methodist Church in Jackson, Mississippi, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody says, do you think people like that get a good case? Let me tell you about a man. I witnessed to him. He was a minister of a Baptist church in Odessa. And uh, I sensed hunger in his heart. And uh, I witnessed to him at times. And in time... This man came to our church. He came walking in on a Wednesday night. When I saw him come in, I didn't let him sit down. I said, uh, I want you to come right down to the front. And uh, he came down to the front. I said uh, to my church, I want you to meet Brother So-and-so, pastor such and such a church here in the city. He and I are having, have been having good studies. And this man is hungry for God. Now then, uh, this man wants to receive the fullness of the Spirit. I would like for this church to pray that the Lord would lead him into the fullness of the Spirit. And so immediately, the church, uh, they had their poor, and they lifted their hands in their praise. And the Spirit of God fell upon this man. He began to weep, and in tears he turned to the church. And he said, this is the first time in my life that a group of people has ever showed that much compassion toward me. And uh, and he was still with me. I just motioned him over to the altar. He came and knelt down at the altar, and in 15 minutes, he had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, he went home. Everything was pretty good. And back to church, everything was pretty good, but the Lord wasn't through with him. God began to continue to deal with him. And uh, <clears throat> so in time, we baptized him in our baptistry in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sin. And when we did that, it was a different story. His wife turned against him with the heat of the hate. She took her children and she left him. That congregation, that poor deacon board rolled up and put him out. And this man started mowing yards for a living in Odessa. He would come over and push the mower around the church and mow it and so on. And someone asked me, you think fellows like that really get the Holy Ghost? And I tell them about this man, and I ask them, would you give up your wife? Would you give up your fellowship with the United Pentecostal Church? Would you give up your local church? Would you? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I frankly don't know whether right now I'd have that much faith. I hope that I would. Uh, and all over the world, there are people like that. There's a thing God is breaking things, and He is crushing things, and He's shifting things, and He's 
hurry. And this is an unusual thing. It's a little rough. Pretty tough. You want all of those folks in your church to see and you're getting the Holy Ghost? I want to tell you about me. You're looking at a man that is Pentecostal from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can be nothing else. I don't intend to be nothing else. I believe it like stock and barrel, and I believe in holiness, and I believe in the word of God, blood, red, snow, white, sky, blue, and gun barrel straight. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I don't deny that God's doing the work out there. I have some friends that uh, received the Holy Ghost and so on, come out of denominations. I met one of them in the aisle. We have fellowship together as when we meet one another. And so we were talking, praising the Lord. And, so and the Spirit moved upon me. I said, I want to get one thing straight with you. I don't know nothing you've got. I said, now, now let's get that understood. I'm not trying to con you. I'm not trying to finagle you into my church. Because I pastor a Pentecostal church, and it's going to stay that way. Praise God. But I don't hate nobody, and I'm not trying to kill nobody, and I'm not trying to defend nothing. I don't have to. I just preach that. That's the whole world of it. Glory. Hallelujah. Not afraid of nobody. Thank God. I'm just carried away with everything. Hallelujah. And so... We have several. In fact, we have nine school teachers in our church. And uh, <clears throat> two of them was talking to a uh, principal of a school there. And he's on his hungry heart. He's telling him to teach a young marriage couple's class. He said, I'm just really anxious for some fresh Sunday school material. And said, yeah, we just kind of run out. He said, the kind that, that we get, said, it just don't click with me like it ought to. And so one of the, our teachers said, we got just what you want. And I uh, said, it's a visual situation. It's supposed to go with it. It's fine. And so he said, oh, I would like that. I said, she went around the morning to me. She not at all. So she brought it the next day. It was a little a situation called search for truth. And uh, <clears throat> so he took that and began to teach that search for truth in his class. And he was on his man when he saw something in the Bible. He just did it. James was talking about washing feet, and he studied it. I said, man, we ought to wash feet. Why show us in the Bible? And I just thought not even just teach a lesson on this to my class. It's in the Bible. We ought to wash feet. So he brought some towels and pans along with him that morning to his, uh, to his class. And this is when one of the larger churches there in the city. So he taught that. And I took over, and he said, all right, but it's in the Bible. And we're ready to wash feet. <clears throat> said, who's going to be first? Well, the folks are sitting there, you know, kind of sedate like, you know, and never heard anything like that. But he just kept on. He got a couple up there to wash his feet. Got down there, and just right in the middle of it, the pastor walked in. And uh, somebody must have tipped him off. He turned around, saw the pastor. He got up with his wet hands and his roll up sleeve. And he came right to the pastor. He said to the pastor, he said, I'm so glad you came. He said, come right in, and I want to wash your feet. I want to submit myself to you. So he said, I recognize your authority over me. So he set the pastor down and wiped his feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the Lord got to deal with him and uh, they got to speaking to the Holy Ghost and they got the Holy Ghost. And this one in fact and got the Holy Ghost and the Lord went through with them. And then they saw that they ought to get baptized. And I was over in Germany and I'd call home every once in a while. That's our five last night from such and such a church. That's our three more. Kept on, man. And it looked like it was more happening back there than it was happening in Germany. And uh, by the time I got back, they said, how many? I said, what's the total tally on that? I said, 18 to baptize. And then the next Sunday, this fine Christian man that's right in our church today, he said, uh, I'd like for everyone in my class that's received the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name to testify. And they did. And then he said, I want to testify. And he testified. And then he said, I must walk in the light as it's revealed to me. This is my last Sunday to teach this class. I will be going up to the first United Pentecostal Church from now on. 
I enjoyed being with you. God bless you all. He turned and walked away. These folks are great people. When we had a reception of new members into the church, well, I took the good word of God, preached the truth. I talked about what the new birth was. I talked about what holy living was. I talked about all of it. It's in the book. Praise God. And so, here they were. Told them what we were expecting of them. And that I didn't want them coming far from membership unless they were trained to live that way. There was a big line. I think it was the 60s or so. And uh, <clears throat> so we started shaking hands with him. Came to this fine man. He took me, he's crying. He said, I feel like a hypocrite up here, he said. He said, we still got our television. He said, hadn't been able to sell it. Got it up for sale. It's unplugged. Turned to the wall. And said, it's going. I said, yeah, I just wanted you to know it's still in the house. But it's going. Oh, Lord. I do not come here to this count meeting to preach an apology. Keep my relationship with Jesus Christ like it ought to be. 
If I keep loving him, enjoying him, praying to him, trying to be like him, just wrapping myself up, praise God, in him. When I die, there's no place else to go for me. I'm going there. That's my destiny. I can't escape it. And Jesus is the main point now with me. And where he is, well, anyway, that's going to be heaven. I just so love him so much. He's the rest of him. Thank God it's, he's the main thing. And if I have preached to somebody tonight that has been despised and discouraged, think about the words of the Apostle Paul that says, Thanks be unto God that gives us the victory. Glory to God. You're a giant of God. God help you. Take care of you. He'll give you grace. Pray in the future. You'll have the grace you need when you get there. If you take care of today, you like you ought to. Somebody asked Spurgeon one time, said, Do you have dying grace? He says, No. He said, What? You don't have dying grace? He said, No. You're a preacher and you don't have dying grace? He said, No. He said, I can't understand that. Why don't you have dying grace? He said, Because I'm not dying. But if I was dying, I'd have dying grace. <laughs> God gives you, will give you the grace that you need for whatever you face. He will be with you in six trials and in the seventh, he will not forsake you. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard against him. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody here tonight needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Here is a place to pray. Let's put up our hands and our hearts. While we're waiting upon the Lord, is there somebody here tonight that'd like to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Praise God, somebody here tonight that'd like to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Here is a place, thank God, the streams of life just flow here tonight. Thank God, there might be a lot of pressure here tonight. There's just a flow here tonight. Anybody like to step into it? You're welcome. Anybody else like to come and receive your baptism tonight? You can. These are saint days. These are unusual days. You can be filled tonight. Praise God. Let's give the Lord away, my friends. Hallelujah.